All right. Well, we will get started. Thank you, everybody, for joining us for our Wednesday Zoom and Learn. Uh, those who don't know me, I think everybody does, but my name is Tommy Dutcher. I'm the area sales manager for California Title Company, and my co-pilot is... Mary Jane Morris with Granite Escrow, VP of Sales. So today we kind of last minute changed things today and um, we wanted to, um, we, we were we were originally going to do procuring cause and we have a couple guest speakers that we had to reschedule last minute. So this topic has come up numerous times, uh, even more so as, as of recent. Um, and that is uh, surrounding COVID, um, renters and landlords and forbearances and uh, what those options look like, uh, what the latest is, things like that. Now I can, I'm just going to kind of paint the picture of what we're going to cover today. We're not going to get in the trenches with the rules, regulations, and laws. I have some great information for you that I put in the chat. It is a link to all of those. So if you're wondering, you know, what those look like, what are my options for my client, um, you know, what do those dates look like? Uh, what does a tenant have to do to be able to qualify for forbearance legally? What is a landlord uh, legally liable to do? All that stuff right there in that link, okay? Um, and that company is owned by a law firm and it is, um, I like how they break it down because it really goes down to <clears throat> county specific because a lot of this stuff is a statewide thing and then a lot of it is a county on top of that and really the way they break it down is whichever one is stricter is the one that you follow so we're not going to get into those rules and regulations we did have a class back in like may where we did that um what we're going to cover today is more so in the lines of there are a lot of tenants or excuse me a lot of landlords out there that are just at the top of the wall ready to jump off and say, I just want to get rid of this property right now. The tenants haven't paid since May. This is happening. That's happening. What are my options? What can I do? How do I go about it? And that's kind of the direction we're going to take today is, is discuss that and um, give you different tactics and options of what potentially you could look at to make that happen, right? Uh, a lot of it's going to come down to the tenants themselves, how cooperative they are, et cetera. But when it's a win-win for them, a lot of times they'll see reason. And that's kind of what we're going to, the angle that we're going to take today. As far as, you know, hey, how far has this been pushed out, et cetera, et cetera, I will say this. The last that I saw and read was January 31st, 2021. And of course, I think that will be pushed and I think it'll be pushed at least three months uh, at a time. And knowing that, you know, we're currently in a full state lockdown and we're in this and we're in the, there's really no light at the end of the tunnel yet. So right now, the date was January 31st, 2021. And again, I can almost guarantee that's going to be pushed back. Okay. So. If you're wondering what that is, all that information is in the link in the chat that I just left. So I'm gonna spin it off to Mary Jane and let you kind of lead us on this and I'll pipe back in and forth. But I mean, the biggest thing that we wanna cover today is what are the options for your client and how you as an agent or a broker can go about helping transition that to make it fruition. Okay, here we go. Um, Tom and I did a lot of talking before on how much uh, law we should or should not even try to present, and it was very complicated. Um, there are a lot of exceptions. You're definitely, if you're going to have to evict, we do recommend a professional eviction service, which um, often runs in the five to one thousand to fifteen hundred dollar range. Uh, per eviction depending on the difficulty of it and they know all the ins and outs um, and will show up and do uh, be, be represented so if you really if you really are facing an eviction issue 
um, you're definitely going to want um, an eviction service. Um, Tommy was correct when he said that different counties are doing it a little different from each other and that the more restrictive one is the one that is required um, to be followed. Um, um, some of the, the two points I wanted to make to get right off is that um, uh, the courts are processing some evictions, but the evictions that they are allowing to go through right now are people who were behind when COVID started. So if it was, if it was uh, already underway, while those were frozen for, for, um, for COVID, they are the first ones that are being processed. And we are starting to see some of those uh, turn up on the news. Um, by the way, um, tenants are much more um, media savvy than they used to be, and they're the ones often calling them the, um, the news stations <laughs> to have them, you know, watch grandma get evicted, you know, in tears with your sign in the front yard. So um, you want to you want to keep that in mind as well. Um, also, um, one of the readings I saw was even for just cause evictions, the procedures are very um, formal. And one of the exceptions um, to the just cause is residential real estate, so, and, and how you hold titles. So very, it's way more complicated than, um, I stay out of property management in general. I, I joke all the time that when, back in the day when I was studying for my broker's license, the most complicated book was the property management book because it was this plus that, or this, and then that. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, um, linear, like many of our other things in real estate. So um, I wanted to, um, I want to talk about, well, so let's just talk about non-COVID times, um, what the procedures are for handling a tenant in the property. As you know, we have the key safe lockbox addendum, and part of that gives permission for the tenant to say whether a lockbox can be on the property. And there's some lines for uh, showing how, how you're going to show. When I teach new agents, I tell them to um, go meet with that tenant and make up some times. If they're work from eight to four and eight to four is going to work for them and they don't want anybody there after they get home from work and they don't want anyone there on Saturdays and Sundays, I can make that happen as long as I have some idea of when they're going to let them in. In COVID times, we seem to be doing some uh, a bulk showing uh, potentially to, to uh exit the property, the agent supervises the entire event, nobody's allowed to touch anything, the clients are out of the house. Um, but um, getting back to my point, um, there is a box in the RPA where you can check that you're going to accept the tenant in the property. Um, you, can, you can check that if there are properties that you buy in an investment or you're not quite ready to move or whatever, and you, <clears throat> you have already <clears throat> and, and thought that having the tenant remain would be a good idea. Never, ever, ever, ever accept a tenant on the RPA that method. Never do it that way. Even if they, even if you are going to consider the tenant, you positively want to see the lease, their payment records. You want to do an estoppel to make sure they, we all know who owns the refrigerator and what they think the deposit was and whether there was a pet. Um, uh, so, and then there's going to be an addendum that says they have been given all of these materials and they now accept the tenant um, in, as to remain in the property. The next sentence is the most important one. And buyer and seller are aware that possession being kept in the, in, in the tenant is not normal business and that the buyer and the sellers waive any agent or broker liability as it applies to the tenant if they accept the tenant in the property. If we close with a tenant in the property, it was the one thing that I would, for all the kindness and sweetness that I throw down in the world um, in my job, this is the one place where I was really strict. I better not hear a tenant stayed in the property after close. And right now, even more so, I have been instructing anybody who will listen that, um, if the tenant is going to stay in the property, even for the seller in possession from one day to 30 days to 45 days, whether they got it for free or didn't get it for free, uh, there should be a waiver to waive off that they understand that there is no eviction procedure that's available right now and that they excuse both the agent and depending which side you are, that they excuse both the seller, the agent and the brokerage from any liability uh, as it relates 
um, to the tenant. Another problem we have is that many sellers have already given notice and they've started working in the, remember this is all pre and post COVID and yet some of this still applies today. So many people have already given notice and perhaps the person is willing to go um, and you're able to work something out um, right, at, right at the beginning. Uh, you, you positively have to, um, um, the, the seller will often have already served the 30 day notice. The problem is, is that when the buyer takes over the tenant, that lease has been concluded as far as it goes to the seller and the 30 day lease does not apply to the new buyer and must be reserved before you, before you can start an eviction. You cannot even start any sort of eviction procedure without the expired 30 day notice. You can't start it at all. So one of the first things I tell people when I'm on the side where we're going to accept a tenant is besides all the documents I have you look at, and the written acceptance of that tenant and permission to close, then waiver also is attached to that a fresh 30 day notice or, um, or longer depending on the type of um, lease or month to month that they are on. It is very important for you to know, um, even in seller in possession, the 30 day notice should be right behind it um, right now. Um, any agent that asks me, I'm, I'm absolutely not allowing, um, and, and uh, many agents will call and say it's only a single day. Um, I think you're all familiar earlier in the year, and I've got the link again, maybe Tom, we can, maybe we can uh, find it and attach it to you, but there was a, there's a case going on in, in San Diego right now where the, the people paid 50,000 over, the tenant didn't even get, the seller stayed the free month, did not even get COVID and decided to squat. And now they are nine months into a, not even, the, the seller didn't even get COVID. They just refused to leave. Um, the homeowner said that he's definitely looking at foreclosure and he never got to move into the, the buyer never even got to move into the house. Um, I'll have to look it up and see how it ended up. But um, yeah, And this, this was like uh, hey. over a million dollar home. The mortgage on it was substantial. And you have this new, this new buyer that's stuck with that mortgage payment, can't get people out of the house, can't evict them, and they, you can't know. threaten them. There's criminal procedures. You can't turn off the, you can't interrupt, interrupt the power, the water. You can't drive by every day. You can't, there's no threats that are allowed of, of any sort or you will be penalized. There, there's actually not only penalties, but criminal charges that are potentially available for a pet, for torturing a tenant. Um, so, um, those are the standard procedures for any tenant that's going to remain in the property or a seller in possession after close at in, in any market, but certainly this one. Don't close without the waiver that they understand that COVID rules may be extended and that there are no eviction procedures. Now, we handled one of these last year. I helped uh, one of the big teams in town uh, get through one of these last year. The, the tenant had been there two or three years. They had done some work on the property and the, the seller was fond of them. However, they were repeatedly late often, one, three, five, ten days. By the time COVID started, they were now officially behind. Um, they had agreed to move because most of the problems had begun before COVID got, did, but there was some, um, the tenant began asking for things like, uh, um, letters saying that they were outstanding tenants that they wanted to present to the new the new homeowners and our our client did not feel comfortable with that <clears throat> they had poor credit and they they were not able to give a great we were not able to give them a great history either so we had a terrible time um, negotiating with them at all and that's where the where they kind of wanted to go um, shortly thereafter the uh, seller, the tenant had a relative who was an attorney and so we heard from him, that person uh, um, pretty quickly. So the minute that happened, I helped them construct a letter that said, we totally understand, absolutely respect, know exactly where we are, you don't need to lecture us. However, is there any room for a negotiation that would allow these people to leave this home so these people can collect their money and go on about their way? Now, Cash for keys, we all learned how to do in the, in the short sale market. And if you've never had to do it, 
for for an agent having to deal with a tenant, usually they're somewhat hostile. Uh, they don't want to talk to you at all. Um, although you know, as you know, I won't say the whole saying, but we all know that money talks. You know, and something else walks. So um, they often will talk to you. They will often talk to you about money. So. This tenant was about three months behind when we finally got into the negotiations. Um, and so in my, Tommy was reluctant for me to get into the specific numbers of what a cash for keys looks like because it can be $500, it can be $1,000. It is often more than that. And the average in my career has been about $5,000 um, for them to walk away. Well, so let's, let's paint the picture on this one, okay? Because yep. you, have, you have two different scenarios here. You have one scenario where maybe the tenants are paying and that landlord wants to potentially sell, right? You have another one where the tenants have not been paying and the landlord wants to sell or needs to sell. So two different scenarios, right? I'm in, a, I'm in, one, I'm in one scenario right now, <clears throat> selling one of the rental houses, the tenants, They've been paying, no problem. They're essential workers. Um, you know, it was a notion of sitting with them and, and having a discussion and be like, hey, listen, we wanna sell the house for these reasons. And, you know, you've been great tenants and we wanna do right by you. So we gave them the opportunity, first right of refusal to purchase the property. Um, they didn't qualify for that, but they qualified for less. So we're like, okay, well, we'll help you find another house. And in this market, you know how difficult that is. So they've been good to a point where they're like, you know what? You guys get an offer and you go into escrow. We're willing to, you know, just move in with family until we find the right house. And at the beginning, we painted the picture of like the notion of like, hey, if you work with us, we'll work with you. We want to do right by you. We want to help. So, you know, we do go into escrow and we haven't found you something yet. You, we will, you know, still want to offer you some moving expenses, stuff like that. And we negotiated that in advance, just to kind of keep everybody happy-go-lucky, moving in the right direction. Now, on the flip side, let's go to the notion where you have tenants that have not been paying. I will say this. If you are a landlord and your tenants have not been paying and you're just assuming that they have taken forbearance, but you haven't seen any documentation, you definitely need to be looking at that link that I put down there to find out exactly legally how a renter has to take forbearance. There are certain things that they must do to qualify for that and things that they must supply the, the landlord to qualify for that. We're not going to get into that, but Look at that and know what that is, because if it wasn't done properly, then there is no forbearance and they're not protected. Okay. Now you just have the eviction process, but on the flip side, let's say somebody took forbearance in May and they have not paid since May. And what are we eight months now? And rent is say $2,000 a month. We're at $16,000 that that landlord is missing. Okay. It doesn't go away. The tenants are liable for that. And in most cases, most tenants cannot come clean on that. Okay. So it could be the notion of having general conversation with them with the notion of like, listen, I know you can't afford this right now. And I definitely as a landlord cannot afford this right now. I need to get out from under this house and therefore I need to sell. If you are willing to work with us and you're willing to do X, Y, and Z, allow us to show the property, keep the property clean, leave it in good condition, et cetera, et cetera, and move out at a 30 day mark, which I'll give you a 30 day notice prior to us entering escrow, then I am willing to do X as a landlord, right? That could be forgive all your back rent, that could be also put money in your pocket to move. That could be Turn whatever your deposit. you come up with. Okay. Deposit. And um, I have heard of two people so far that were able to get tenants that were six months, eight months behind and get them to understand that 
that does not go away, that when all of this is lifted, you will be evicted, and two, you will be in small claims court. And that judgment will be won, and you will be liable for that somehow, some way. You may not pay it now, but it's going to be on your record until you do. Um, and it was the notion that they finally understood that, and the notion that, okay, great, I'm X thousands of dollars in the hole, and you're willing to forgive that, and you're willing to put a little bit of money in my pocket to help with moving, yeah, I think I'll take that type of thing, okay? So it, it all comes down to how you present it, one. It all comes down to the tenant being accessible and available to listen to what you have to present, right? Some were just like, nope, don't want to talk to you, leave me alone, because the relationship's already gone that way. And in some cases, the relationship hasn't gone that way, and it's just a, a conversation for them to understand the value and what you are offering to them from a landlord perspective. Okay. We added a little suspense to our too. We said that we had an excellent offer to make them. To which representative would they like to, to listen to that? Um, so we, we created sort of suspense for the situation. So if mom didn't want to take our call and dad wasn't going to take our call, then you know somebody's dad was going to take our call or something like that. I actually feel like when I talk to a lawyer, I have much better options. I've said that many times. I'm going to say that over and over because the emotion's out of it and they're dealing with the facts. So um, you can create a little suspenseful situation. And the, and the one that we cleaned up last year, it cost the buyer, uh, it cost the seller about $8,000. About three of that was, um, three of that was um, back rent and five was just please do not go and here's your deposit. So the at the time that we had negotiated this, we were about May 1 and at, the most we thought, we realistically thought they could be looking at a two year hold on that tenant at that point um, before the reports um, were going to be processing. And then they're going to be back up to the moon as well. So, it's, you know, they can only process so many arguing people um, a day. Correct. And, and let's, you know, it doesn't always have to be that the landlord wants to sell. I mean, you know, there are landlords out there right now, I'm sure, are negotiating with these tenants to try and get them out. Like, listen, you owe this amount of back rent. You know, you can, here's the process and, and, and what I will have to take when all this is lifted, or we can look at it this way and just wipe the slate clean and you can move on. You know, it, it, it takes a while because when forbearance is new and it, let's just call it somebody only takes forbearance for two months or three months. And you're talking, you know, rent is, 1800 or 1500 whatever it is um it's it's not as um it doesn't hit home as much as when you start getting into the tens of thousands of dollars in the hole right and yeah small claims court you can only go up to so much but bottom line is ten thousand dollars to somebody who doesn't have ten thousand dollars is is a big hit it's going to put you in the position or your client in the position of being a debt collector um, yeah. as well. And um, all, all it does is actually get you a lien. It doesn't necessarily get you the, the money. So um, it, it, it could take years before. And um, so it's, it's not a small claims court is, is an exhausting process that at least gets a suggest, at least gets a solution on the books. Um, it's not that easy to collect after from people who don't have it in the first place. Well, exactly. So let's put that in perspective. A landlord that is just adamant about, nope, I'm not wiping the slate clean. You know, I'll go after him afterwards, right? That type of attitude. Um, keep in mind that you're dealing with a renter that doesn't own real property, at best owns a car, and you're going to take him to small claims court and only get a percentage of what they really owe you because it only can only win up to so much in small claims. And then what? So what if you're awarded the judgment on it? What do you have as collateral to lean? Probably not much, right? In most cases, you have nothing and they have nothing. So therefore, you're holding a judgment that means nothing. 
because they're just going to go rent somewhere else. They'll continue to live their life, and that judgment will just sit there, and it's going to accrue a interest. There's in court, both in divorce court and in small claims, that if there are competing claims, the judge will give a lien to both of you. So one of the ones we cleaned up last year was the tenant owed almost twenty thousand dollars in in back rent and other things, um, but had sufficiently earned his deposit back by pictures and all that sort of thing. So the judge gave a twenty five hundred dollar judgment to the tenant um, that the seller had to give, and gave a twenty thousand dollar one to to the um, to the tenant. However, when we went to sell the house, the lien against the seller popped up for $2,500 and we wound up trading the $20,000 for the $25,000. And, uh, and that was with them insisting this tenant was truly the epitome of the, of the kind you don't want to mess with. I mean, you don't want in your life. They, would, they were determined that if we were in this position that that house was not going to transfer without additional funds. Um, and so if they didn't just want the 20, they wanted, the, they, they wanted more than the 20. Um, we did finally get everybody to agree to wash each other's liens out so that we could transfer the property. But, um, so I want you to be aware that more than one, if they're competing complaints and, um, People who get uh, sued often counterclaim, um, it, like 75% of them. Uh, most of them think they have to, like they have to give some sort of answer and so they're gonna say their part two, not realizing that in small claims you can say your side without filing and the judge is still going to listen to, listen to that. So you, very often you're gonna be de dealing with a completing, uh, competing claim and they are going to um, potentially wind up with two judgments um, one on either party. So um, it's not a great solution. So um, we were grateful when uh, Daryl suggested this topic today. Um, we, did, we did quite a bit of research. We hope to bring you a fancier version with laws and all that. But after, you know, Tommy and I both dug into it, we could see that we should do what we're licensed to do and stay out of those. There's, um, there's, there's too many gray areas right now with the extensions and uh, you know, we don't want to get into um, directing you in the wrong direction in any way, shape, or form, because that's not our place. Our place is to give you the facts. So we gave you facts, and we gave we gave you a nice contact in the comments there to get all those answered. Uh, that company, and we have I have used them. Tenants out of properties all through the short sale. Tenants, this, yeah. this it is not uncommon. This is where we felt like we could really empower you. Um, it is not uncommon to go have to have a try to go have a good relationship with the tenant. Try to show only when they want to be shown. Uh, try to arrange. Um, um, I'm going to say out loud. Please don't rely on any law we told you. But one of the ones that I read today that is so simple, I feel like I, I'm confident enough to say about it. If you are going to have a happy just cause exemption. The, the this one of, if you read those attachments it says you owe them one month's rent period um, the seller was going to get one month's rent and it could be taken in either direction it could be taken as um, uh, actual cash payment or you can wait the last 30 days um, of there so the idea that the tenant isn't owed anything to start is not correct either right. That's the important especially if they're in good standing they 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 are, if you're going to attempt a just cause. Um, those are the ones that are being filed right now, by the way, many people are truly have the horrible tenant that's tearing up the property and um, um, whether they're paying or not, they've, they've got a criminal enterprise going there. The neighbors have called the police 20 times. There, there, are, there are other things besides uh, not paying. Um, there are five basic just cause rules that we posted for you guys. But even those claims right now uh, are factored against COVID. Um, yeah, er everything's factored against COVID right now. And we're in some weird times. I mean, I read an article yesterday of a gentleman that rented an Airbnb for four days, moved his family into the Airbnb, changed his address, did everything like he is renting that place and moved into it, even though it was only rented for four days. 
and the landlord right now is beside himself because he can't evict him, right? I, I mean, I read this horror story of this yesterday and I was like, wow. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of it comes down to communicating, just like anything. If, if the landlord can't communicate well, maybe the agent or broker can, saying that you are representing that landlord, right? Um, they have a representative because, you know, and, and the, the couple that have gone to get representation, they pay for that representation themselves. They're not, yeah. you're, not, not you're not having to pay for their lawyer so they can get advice. Um, but you, you, but um, the trick of asking if they have a representative to hear your offer um, often yeah. sets a tone um, of cooperation. Um, you know, we avoid all the usual stuff, name calling, um, um, restating facts that we, we've only heard through our client um, and don't know the other half of the story from the tenant's perspective. Um, so yeah, cause there's always two sides to every story, but re regardless of getting into all that, it's kind of like, if there's a way of trying to get them to lawfully want to move, versus dragging it out and having to go through an eviction process, et cetera. Yes, it's gonna cost the landlord uh, money. It's gonna cost back rents. It's gonna cost maybe some cash for keys. It, it's gonna cost, but it's still gonna be cheaper than them staying there for another six, eight, 10 months rent free, and then having to go through the eviction process. Keep in mind the state of California now, it's 60 day notice after one year now, it's not after two. So it's not just a 30 day notice. Now you got to go to a 60 day. So now that's an extra two months after you started your eviction process. So sometimes it's just one of those things where you look at it and say, I don't see this changing anytime soon. And what I mean by that is we already know it's going to the end of January and let's say it gets extended another three months after that. Now we're at the end of April going into May, we're almost mid year. Do you want to just drag it on or do you want to find out if there is a way of communicating with the tenants and giving also, them out. I also recommend strictly from an escrow point of view that you want to do all this on HUD. Although a lease and all that could be done outside of your transaction, cleaning up a lease because it's between the landlord and it's not really a part of your transaction. If you do it on HUD, um, I recommend it in both cases. I never did hear the answer, but I recommend it in both cases that they take these losses to their tax person and see what could be what could be done. There's going to have to be some governmental assistance to where the landlords could get some type of write off or loss. I mean, of course you can write the loss, but you're only, you can only write off so much of a loss per property, right. you and, know, but and the, but the best cases, place to, have losses to write off. But the best place to best document for those kinds of cases is going to be show it on the closing statement. Yeah. So um, just like every other thing we pay. Um, yep. and, and we'll keep you out of, you know, any out, especially if you help with negotiations, you can't be doing it under the table as well. Yeah. So, so let's, let's open it up because we're at that 108 right now and I know you have a class. So let's open it up real quick for questions or situations that maybe we can help you uh, work through. Any questions from, from the gallery? Daryl? Um, I have a question. Can you hear me? Yep. So um, if we run into a situation where the, we have a couple of inexperienced newer landlords <laughs> just bought the property, what I perceive at the top of the market, very little margins, um, tenant hasn't been paying. Um, I remember, you know, 10, 15 years ago where it would take forever for the, you know, NODs to get through the system and, you know, we'd walk into a surprise. Um, is there anything that you may suggest to, you know, make sure that we're not walking into, you know, an unforeseen situation where eventually it's probably going to become a short sale? Well, keep in mind right now, you can't just walk in and notice a default because you, you're not in a situation, they're not in a situation of recording those right now. So until all this is lifted, it's not even a possibility. So how long do you wait before you could do that? And then I can tell you when that happens, it's going to be processed in the order in which they were received, which means you could process it, let's just say today, and it could take three months before it actually hits 
and gets signed off to be a, a notice of default. So, you know, we're, we're talking long time, time schedules here once it, they do open it up. I want to remind you all a general rule, which is living by your net sheet. Um, I still bump into every single day agents who don't do net sheets on listings and have no idea. Um, one, we had to clean up the, the, the agreed list price was less than the mortgage. Um, and the agent and the brokerage got hit for the shortage because they didn't do their, they didn't do, it was a reverse mortgage and it was reversing out every month. Um, and, and so um, net, if you, if you don't know how to do a net sheet, you must know that your favorite escrow company, which I would like to think is us, um, would produce you a net sheet almost in minutes. Um, and Tommy's got that great tool. Um, I was super impressed with the uh, net uh, sheet tool on Tommy. Forget the name of the, the program, but yep, the title advantage. Yep. Title advantage. I did it. All right. Uh, I was really impressed with that one because um, as a retired S officer, I expect a little more of my net sheet, but this one was in, uh, intuitive enough where you could plug in what you yeah. need. I got a very comprehensive one as opposed to the five lines total on the MLS um, net sheet, which is not acceptable. Yeah. I mean, my net sheet is very similar to an escrow's net sheet is it gives them the autonomy to add in whatever they want. It's not just a standardized net sheet of, you know, 10 points and that's all you could put in there. Um, yeah, so back in the short sale market, I'm just following Daryl's thought here. Back in the short sale market, we, we would ask, have you stopped making your payments? You yeah. know, so that's going to be something you need to ask right now. Are, are you making the payments? Um, and how many have you missed? And, um, and all that. Not only that, you get a listing right now. Um, and uh, let, let's say that they're selling because they are behind, right? They haven't made some payments. You need to be asking the other question on top of that too is, how long have you not been paying? Check the tax sheet and, and even though those are behind right now, you wanna make sure taxes are up to date. Not only that, have you been missing your HOA if there's an HOA? How far behind on the HOA are you as well? Because all that adds up and any one of them could put you in a short sale. And then, because okay. I just saw I just saw an association put a lien on a property last week because they found out that property's for sale. They owed thousands of dollars to the association with fees because they've been behind for so long. And um, you know, as soon as they saw that it was for sale, they put a lien against the property. So I'll tap you know, on that one, Tommy. We had a foreclose the HOA foreclosed on a piece in Canyon yep. Lake. Um accepted a listed and accepted another offer and immediately the um we discovered that they it had 50 grand in past due taxes you would think the hoa would or the listing agent would have uh, uh, caught that before they made it all the way into the offer now if they are in a a standoff where they are positively not one's not going to the hoa won't pay it and the and the buyer but the buyer's refusing to let them out of the contract He's refusing to let him out. He's not, do not sell it to anyone else until, yeah. we, until we solve this problem. So um, just know that right now, I think the, the picture we're trying to paint is the best case scenario for any landlord right now that potentially wants to sell is to find a way to negotiate with the tenant to where you can move forward and do that because there is no end date in sight yet. So we don't know how long this is gonna get pushed out. And the longer it goes, the more they, they're they losing out on anyway, right? Right now with inventory levels low, they can get top dollar in most cases for that property. They're gonna take a loss on the back rents, but ultimately they're probably not gonna get all of that back anyway. Please remember, if nothing else, my initial warning that if you're doing any sort of rent back right now, that you have a, a, an addendum that says that there are no eviction and that the your client, the agent, and the brokerage are excused from any liability regarding the tenant. That is the most important advice I can give you right now because sellers are negotiating to stay in the property a month all the time now, just all the time now, and at no cost because of the competitiveness of the market. So um, I've had TCs call me and say, well, it's only one day. And I'm like, well, it is one day when we before, but how many days after? 
is it going to be when right. when we're down the road on it? So yes, from day one, the SIP, or if you're having a rent back, should have a waiver protecting you, acknowledging that COVID exists um, and that there are no procedures for eviction at this time, and that your you have been excused from the broke uh, your client, the agent, and the brokerage have been excused. Uh, by the way, that won't stop you from getting called to the case, but it will get you excused pretty quickly um, in the case once the judge has a chance to, to see it. Um, what else? Any well, other that, questions? That's awesome. Now, just just one, one more thought, a thought process, and you know, I don't want to hog the conversation, but no. So, I mean, you guys have been great when, for the listings that we have. You know, we do the uh, title and escrow when we take the listings. Um, but I read something the other day that San Bernardino County is pushing back their or accelerating their times for documents to be uh, recorded. So we have to have them to the recorder's office an hour or so earlier. Um, and I think that's probably going to be the norm rather than the exception. Um, is there any guidance coming down from, you know, either the title side or escrow side of when we should get things um, into escrow and, and, and into recording uh, earlier by, you know, like we used to do business and come in and <laughs> be All right, able to so do things. I'll take this one. It's not just San Bernardino County. Riverside County shut off used to be 4 p.m. It's now 3 p.m. That changed a month ago. San Diego County used to be 4. It's now 3. That changed on Monday this last week. Uh, San Bernardino moved theirs up to 3 p.m. Um, title companies always had a, a deadline time and it was usually about an hour before um, what the county recorder's deadline is because why? We have to abstract that into the system so we can electronically record it and that takes time. Um, is it the norm? Yeah, it is the norm. Look at LA County. LA County, they shortened their times and they gave time slots to each title company and they do it on a morning basis. So there is no, okay, you record at 8 a.m. Now, we may not have a recording slot until 1 p.m. that day. It just, it's random draw. So, you know, things are changing. I think what helped us was TRID guidelines, you know, years back when, when that passed is kind of stopped the, the whole notion of being able to do things on a whim. What I mean is like, okay, we're going to sign, we're going to fund, we're going to do this and do it all in one day. Right now, theoretically, typically what happens is you sign your loan docs, it funds maybe the next day if you're lucky, and then we record either same day or next day, right? Um, counties are also, and I don't see this going away, a lot of counties, LA started it, wouldn't allow third party to drop off anything, hand deliver anything to be recorded unless you were part of the party meaning the seller or the buyer. You had to either be the seller or buyer to hand deliver recording docs to record that day as a special, where we used to be able to send a messenger to drop it off or send myself as a title rep to drop it off. And with COVID hitting, it took the ability to hand deliver stuff out. They don't allow it. And I really don't see that opening back up, be honest with you. Um, so yeah, I mean, things are progressing down that path. Things are becoming tighter uh, to a point where, I mean, the, the email that we got from San Diego County recorders was, uh, that started on Monday was this. Our systems are as follows. Our hard deadline is 3 p.m. At 3.01, anything that's received at 3.01 or later will revert over to tomorrow 8 a.m. recording, period. Um, and I experienced that firsthand with with a file this week, uh, where literally it got there two minutes late and it went next morning. So- Next business day, it's Friday. Which yeah, is correct. And if that, if that was a Friday afternoon, that would be Monday. And if Monday was a holiday, that would be Tuesday. So yeah, um, I, I, I see it moving in that direction. Uh, ultimately keep in mind, county recorder, is not who electronically receives the, the documentation. It's a third party company that works on behalf of the county recorder's office. And they get there at 7 a.m. because they have prep work that needs to be done to start the recordings. First recording window is 8 a.m. 
and they used to receive until four. You see that time frame, seven to four? No, it's seven to five at least before they get out of there. So ultimately is they're bringing it back into play to where they can have one shift instead of two shifts managing that. And, um, you know, it, it, business perspective makes sense. Should we be recording as a, as just as an industry, should we be recording at four o'clock in the afternoon? No, we shouldn't. You know, ultimately it, that, that shouldn't happen. Does it happen? Yeah. Why? Because we're waiting for lenders to fund and we don't get the funds until 204. And then we still have to abstract it from escrow and get it to title and everything else doesn't leave a window going forward as agents and brokers in title and escrow, we need a plan for that and just know that for our clients, hey guys, recording deadline is 3 p.m. If docs are, are being uh, delivered or signed or if it's being funded that day, if they didn't release those funds by 10 a.m., it ain't recording today, more than likely. Just know that. Because there's too many things that have to play a part between title and escrow and the lender for that to happen by 2 p.m. Right? So if it happened at 10, 10 30, maybe 11 is pushing it. But if it happened at noon, one, it's probably not going to record that day. Then we have to paint that picture and prep them for it so it's not a shock when it doesn't. Because I can tell you it's going to happen. It's happened to me already this week. So we're pretty good at the, keeping those options open for you. As I mean, we, we live and breathe this stuff and we, we will give it our best shot always you know we we i added to, to job description recently that if you don't love closing just for the closing um fun of it you you, you need a better escrow title person anyway so um we understand that the, the primary function is record before it burns down and frankly that's how they used to teach you they used to say you miss this recording it's going to burn down tonight and there's not going to be a recording so they, um, we're, we're pretty good at it. If you give us some idea of what's going on. In fact, I used to joke, please tell me the moving van story on Wednesday so that I can do something about it before three o'clock on, on, on Friday. Yeah. And not only that is every company is different. You know, we're, as, as an agent, you're used to your preferred lenders and how they operate. But then all of a sudden you have a listing and the buyer is using a lender that you don't know and that lender is out of say Orange County and they don't uh, fund off a of scanned copy. So it means you have to sign those loan docs and the originals have to go back to the lender for them to approve them. And then those loan docs still need to get back to title and escrow. And you know, that's hard to make happen in a day. So there's a lot of moving parts that everybody has to understand that, that plays a part to get things recorded on time. And with the times being shortened, it will play a part. But just know that every county in Southern California, basically at this point, has shortened their time schedules down. Um, I am um, close to having to step away because we have new forms coming out. Um, we'll definitely be on next week with you for new forms. I'm going to leave Tommy to um, take your last questions and close up for us. Um, we are getting a new uh, COP form. The COP form is the most complicated form we have, and you would think the contract would be, but it's it's nothing compared to the COP form. So they are trying to iron out so that you're not guessing what you've gotten and what you've given away and when you can do it. So um, next week, we will definitely be talking about the new COP forms. There, And that's probably going to be our longest conversation. There's only five other forms total, So, uh, but this one's going to be an important one. Um, Tommy, as always, I'm grateful for your uh, for your help. And um, I'm before you sign off, I'm going to put you on the spot. Yes, new forms are coming, and she's going to handle all new form stuff for us next week on the 16th, same time, same place. However, by the end of January, middle of February, I want to have a class as well where uh, Mary Jane goes over the listing contract, the purchase contract in depth. Um, that's a class that. I've been through with her a couple times and it's, I, I don't care how, if you've been in the business for 30 years, you're going to learn something. Um, and I, teach you, uh, how to, really I teach you how to write a winning contract. I'm not teaching you the law. I'm teaching yeah. you how to write a winning contract. 
Yeah. All right. Thank you, MJ. I appreciate you. All right. Thank you all. Thanks, Tommy. Thanks, everyone. Bye. And, and uh, we'll, we'll take any, any last questions that anybody has. Uh, again, in the comments, uh, I did leave a link there. That company I've used numerous times, I've referred numerous times. Um, in normal times when evictions are happening, uh, they are awesome. It's owned by a law firm. So it's not like uh, an eviction company that then takes it and takes it to a law firm to do the paperwork and record and they charge you a thousand bucks. They're extremely reasonable and uh, just know that it is a law firm doing it. Um, and they handle everything from start to basically lockout. So um, the, the link that I left there though, list all the COVID uh, rules and regulations and where we're at currently and uh, those time frames and the process for both sides. Um, as an agent, as a broker, uh, as a TC person, whoever you are on this, I would recommend that you at least read through that stuff so that you're familiar with it so that you can at least direct people in the right direction uh, with facts versus um, maybe something you've heard. Okay. Maybe something you've heard. Okay. Tommy, where's that link at? Tommy, where's that link at? Tommy, where's that link at? All right. So I'm gonna I'm gonna mute Brenda because we were getting background noise from her. Um, it is in the comments. So not in the, the chat. chat. Yeah, in the chat. I didn't see it. It's not showing on mine. Okay. So you may have came in late. So I will okay. put it there again. Oh, so there just, it is. I just put it back in the chat. If you came in late, you may not have saw it. Um, but uh, that link has some great information and it will direct you in the right direction. Um, I think the biggest thing with today's class, uh, it was a last minute class, but I had asked a handful of agents on Monday, hey, what type of topic would you like to cover? And I got some feedback and then Daryl had uh, sent me a message back and said, I sent you an email and I went and looked at it and it was on, you know, landlords, where they're at, uh, evictions, what can you do during COVID? There's, there's a lot of landlords out there that are frustrated right now that are not being paid. They would like to unload these houses and just know that where there's a will, there's a way. Uh, you as a professional has to come to the conclusion of what that may be. And your client, meaning the landlord, may not always be um, in the right state of mind to make that judgment call right away. And what I mean by that is they may be in the mindset of, um, you know, uh, I don't care. They need to pay. They need to do this. They need to do that. And that's not the right mindset because ultimately, if he's able to sell that house right now and get out from under it, he still puts money in, it, in, in their pocket more than likely, right? Or you can drag this out and not be able to do anything and the tenants stay there, not pay, not pay for months and months and months, and then still have to go through the eviction process, which I will tell you, you will still need to give notice. You will still need to do all that. And then it will be prolonged. Why? Because there will be thousands of eviction notices filed at one time. So, it's in everyone's best interest to try and convince the tenants that the best scenario for them is to walk away and leave voluntarily and that they won't be liable for X amount of rent and all the other stuff that goes along with it because you don't know where the end is yet. And even if the end was the end of Jan you know, January, which we know it's not going to be. But even if it was, if I'm a bet man, I would say it would be the end of June before you got that person out. So, you know, as a professional, you have to present those cases to your clients to where they understand that, okay, I'm willing to just wipe the slate clean if they're willing to, to move, right, voluntarily. Um, as a tenant, it would behoove them to do it, but they don't always see that way either, right? So there's no one way, one right way of doing it, and every situation is going to be slightly different. 
Um, and if you need help working through what those potential situations could be, feel free to reach out to myself or Mary Jane. And if we can't answer those questions, we can definitely put you in contact with somebody who can give pretty good guidance to do so. Um, because again, every situation is going to be unique. So, all right, any other questions, guys? No? I just had one, one save round. Hey, uh, that scenario you did uh, earlier, that was on Inside Edition maybe a couple of days ago where the guy, the owner went back into the Airbnb and started filming the guy saying, you, you and your family stole my house. And right. I had to run out the door, but I believe they arrested the owner for invading their privacy. So <laughs> just be careful. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy out there. And, you know, um, anything to do with real property rentals right now is such a shaky road. I mean, um, you know, knock on wood, I'm grateful that uh, the rental properties that, that we have, uh, you know, we have essential workers uh, renting them, et cetera, just happen to be that way. But, you know, it, it's tough because some, some people own rentals that they barely break even on. Some people own rentals that they make very good money on. And uh, they may be able to ride out a storm, but majority of them aren't in that situation to ride out that storm without it financially affecting them. And uh, so it's, it's a very touchy situation on both sides. Um, just know that there are legal ways that people have to go about doing it. And if on either side they didn't do it correctly, then, it, then there's nothing in place protecting them. You know? It'd be like you as a landlord not drawing up a lease but renting your property to somebody. Legally, you have nothing to go by. Uh, it's basically what they say versus what you say. Well, forbearance, there's standardized things that the tenants have to do to legally take forbearance. And if they didn't do it right, then they're not in forbearance. They're just strictly not paying you. So know what that is and those, uh, those links will help you there, okay? All right, guys. Well, thank you for your time. Daryl, if you can hang on, I got a question for you. Um, but thank you for your time. Next, sure. week, next week, again, we're doing new forms. There are updates to a lot of the forms in CAR that Mary Jane just had to leave us for for a training. She's going to come back next week on December 16th at 1230 and walk us through all those changes to the new forms. So you will not want to miss that as an agent or broker because you deal with those on a daily basis. Um, and um, until then, I'll thank you guys for joining us and um, hope to see you again next week. Same time, same place. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Tommy.